morning, and welcome to Leroy United Methodist Church. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. A few announcements that I would like to call to your attention as we begin our time of worship this morning. First, since it is raining, our outdoor worship this morning at 1030 is canceled. We will be sending the YouTube link out for everyone who misses our, our live streaming. We also will have fellowship time via Zoom at 1015, and that link will be sent out as well. If you need that, please let us know. We'll send you a message. We do have our ongoing food collection for the Lodi Food Pantry, so we thank you for your contributions for that. You can place your canned goods and such on the porch by the church office. Also, Danita Kindle says many, many thanks for all of the magazines that we have collected for the Cloverleaf Elementary Music Program. Um, they are very grateful for that, and they have enough now, so thank you. Uh, also, our East Ohio Conference is having their annual conference sessions the weekend of September 25th through the 27th. So on Sunday, September 27th, we will have worship with all of the churches across our annual conference via the conference uh, webpage or live stream at 10 o'clock. So we will not be streaming a service that day, and we will not have outdoor worship that day on September 27th. Special thanks to all who are participating here in our streaming sanctuary worship this morning. Special thanks to Josh Leatherman, who is on tech this morning, as well as Matt Chidsey on the piano, and Teresa Leatherman, who is our lay leader this morning. If you would like to be a part of our streaming sanctuary worship, please let us know. We're inviting small groups of people in to participate in that. So now, let us prepare our hearts for worship as Teresa comes to bring us the call to worship. Good morning. Would you join me in the call to worship? Um, sing praise to God who rescues us when we fall. Sing, sing praise to God who walks with us on all our journeys. Even though we fall, God lifts us and places us on paths of peace. Even though we stray, God finds us and brings us back to lives of hope. Thanks be to God whose love is continually with us. Praise, Praise be to, to God, God, whose mercy is over us all. Amen. Now we're going to sing Amazing Love for our opening song.
chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went out and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay in his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Please pray with me. Oh God, we thank you for your great love, your amazing love. Your amazing love that forgives us again and again and again. We thank you for these words and teachings of Jesus that instruct us on how to be faithful followers of you. And we ask, oh God, that you open our hearts to your word, Jesus Christ, and these words of his today. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Someone once said that there are really only maybe seven or eight basic themes for sermons. And if that is true, I would say that forgiveness is definitely one of those themes. Jesus speaks often about forgiveness, and he does so as strongly as anything else that he says. Forgiveness is at the center of the Lord's Prayer. We say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness is central to the many parables and the many stories that Jesus shares throughout all of Scripture. In today's lectionary text from the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has been teaching about how to live together as God's people, living together in a community of grace. As we learned from the preceding verses, verses 15 through 20, last week, he has just given his followers instruction about what to do when you have a conflict with someone. You go and you confront that person and you strive for restoration, you strive for community. And the disciples have heard these words and, and then there's Peter, our, our bold friend Peter. He comes and he asks Jesus, so, okay, so if someone sins against me, how many times 
must I forgive them? Seven times? And now Peter, Peter knows that forgiveness is a crucial part of a faithful life. Surely forgiving someone seven times seems pretty extravagant. Well, it has to be enough, right? Enough faith and love, enough forgiveness to please God. But Jesus says, not, not seven times, but 77 times. Some translations even say 70 times seven. But whether the number is 77 or the number is 490, Jesus is saying that forgiveness is absolutely essential to a faithful life. And even calculating it or trying to count it is out of bounds. It's just completely out of bounds for faithful people. Forgiveness is meant to be our way of life. Disciples, forgive and forgive and forgive. That's Jesus strong in his continuous message. And as followers of Jesus Christ, I think that this is pretty much an accepted, generally accepted premise. That forgiveness is important to Jesus. That as his followers, we should indeed be forgiving people. We accept that, right? But what we struggle with is how to practice it. How do we practice it? How do we move from where we often find ourselves? Hurt and angry and victimized, abused or alienated to where we can say, I am more than that. God calls me to more than that. How do we get our hearts and our minds and our thoughts free from, from anger and hurt and revenge? And how do we move then to sincere forgiveness? Forgiveness from our hearts. That's what Jesus wants from us. In order for us to move from that place where we find ourselves, that place of hurt or alienation or anger or, or having a vengeful heart, to where we're called to live, boundless forgiveness. Jesus tells this story about a king and a slave. And this story is, is filled with circumstances that are exaggerated, totally exaggerated, in order to make his points. Could a king be so extremely generous, forgiving this, this massive debt from a lowly slave? Well, the point is pretty clear. That is how much God is forgiving each one of us. And could a slave who has been forgiven so extravagantly then be so harsh, harsh, to a fellow slave who had a meager debt? We're talking millions and millions of dollars to like $10. I mean, it's a, it's a huge difference. <laughs> Could someone actually walk out of the king's palace on this, this road that has been paved with freedom and grace and then act so cruelly to fellow slaves who are in debt? Well, that hyperbole makes the point. In fact, that is how we often live when we don't forgive. So in this scripture, Jesus uses two tools or, or methods to motivate us here. There is the grateful response. God forgives so much. We are called to forgive. Goodness tends to lead toward goodness. Grace intends to evoke gratitude and then more grace from us. That's the grateful response. But it doesn't always happen like that. So then there's this other motivator, punishment. When the slave fails to respond to this generous forgiveness, there's the threat of punishment. Jesus says, so my father will also do to every one of you if you 
do not forgive. Which motivator speaks most to you? <laughs> Some of us are motivated by positive news <laughs> that calls us to be our very best selves, are moving our, in our very best way toward the kingdom or the reign of God. In Jesus' story, we have been given immense, immense grace, <laughs> just like the slave of the king. Some of us, though, seem to be motivated by fear or, or punishment. <laughs> Look, forgiveness is so central to life. And if we like that idea of forgiveness, but we fail to implement forgiveness into our heart and into our lives as disciples, well, Jesus tells us there will be punishment. Jesus wants to motivate us to faithful lives as his disciples. Lives that actually practice forgiveness. Not sometimes, not seven times, but always and endlessly. What Jesus wants is forgiveness from our hearts. Not ideas like, well, I can forgive, but I can't forget. <laughs> That's not forgiveness from our hearts. Or we might say, I know that I'm supposed to love her, but I'm not going to like her. <laughs> That's not forgiveness from our hearts. Perhaps we might find some real forgiveness from our hearts in this way. First, we always have to remember, remember the context in which we live. We have to remember that we belong to God. That God's love covers us. God's grace and mercy and forgiveness, like the slave in the story, tend to, to form the backdrop of everything about our lives. We remember that God gives us all that God gives us. And we remember what Jesus expects of us. That forgiveness intends to be central to our lives. Some might call this remembering rightly. Remembering rightly. Now, what we tend to remember is the wrong that has been done to us. What we tend to remember is that feeling of hurt or that feeling of betrayal that we experience. We tend to remember how we are victims of the wrongs that have been done to us. And when we remember only those things, we take on the ways of the world, not the ways of God. When we remember only that evil that has been done to us, we don't move toward redemption or salvation or discipleship. We don't participate in the emerging reign of God, but in that struggling world that Jesus came to redeem. Jesus calls us to another kind of remembering, to remember the larger reign of God, the grace that covers us, the grace that sustains us. Forgiven so extravagantly, we are to be people who forgive. It's not just a good idea. It has to be our way of life. Secondly, we have to work at changing our thinking, changing our feelings. When we find ourselves betrayed or hurt or angry or abused, our, our tendency is to react <laughs> rather than respond. We tend to be full of vengeance and aggression instead of forgiveness. To hold grudges instead of living with grace. Jesus encourages us not to just react with some kind of aggressive thought or negative feelings. Jesus encourages us to respond in such a way that another more faithful or a moral fabric emerges, that a new realm takes shape. 
The cycle of evil and hatred is broken by love and forgiveness. The cycle of revenge and abuse is broken by new thoughts and, and feelings that actually free us for a life that's closer to God's heart. I'm reminded of an old saying about anger and hatred. To nurture our anger and hatred, they say, is like drinking poison, hoping it will kill the other person. But all it does is kill us and separate us from God's love. Seventy times seven, seventy-seven times, we forgive and forgive. Now, I want to be clear. To forgive doesn't mean that we condone what was done to us. To forgive doesn't mean that we just acquiesce or we deny justice. To forgive means that we refuse to let what happened destroy us and alienate us from God. That we refuse to let it alienate us from one another, our community. It demands hard work and vigilance, but it's the way to life, <laughs> and it's the way to discipleship, and it's the way to God. Jesus invites us to forgive from our hearts. He invites us to forgive from our hearts. May we all be <laughs> that way as his faithful disciples. Amen. Amen. We don't have to beg God to forgive us. But we have to just simply confess our foolish words, our mistaken acts, our grudging hearts. Please join me as we pray together, saying, Merciful God, we could have mercy, but we judge others by those standards we cannot even meet. We would welcome everyone around us as sisters and brothers, but hold them at contempt's length away from us. We could have patience with family and friends, but tap our feet and drum our fingers until they do what we want. In your forgiveness, tender God, you wipe the board clean of all our poor accounting. You don't deal from the bottom of the deck, but turn up the ace of grace for us. You gather up all our foolishness and hurl it beyond the edge of the universe. So the healing you intend for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, will take place. Here is the good news. God does not hold a grudge against us. God lets go of anger to welcome us as sisters and brothers of Jesus. We will not be afraid, but will open our hearts and lives to God's compassionate grace. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. As forgiven people and forgiving people, we come into God's presence with the joys on our hearts and the concerns of our hearts. We invite you to share your joys and concerns in the comments below. If you have a joy or concern that you would like to keep confidential, please send us a message. But we would like to be praying with you and for you. A few things I call to your attention for us to be praying for as a community of faith. We want to continue to pray for all of the students and teachers at the Cloverleaf School District. Um, they've had their first week of classes this week. Um, not just students and teachers, but all the staff, bus drivers, everyone, um, as they continue to live into this new normal. Um, so just continue to hold them in your prayers. Also prayers for Cindy McDermott who is um, the line dancing instructor on Fridays, 
uh, who has entered hospice care this week. So please hold Cindy in your prayers as well. Let us take a moment for some silent prayer as we center ourselves in God's presence, and we'll have the pastoral prayer. Gracious and loving and merciful God, we come into your presence this morning, grateful for all that you have done for us. We know that you forgive us if we come to you and admit. We know that you forgive us in ways that are beyond our imagining, in ways that are extravagant. Oh God, fill us with your love and your grace and your mercy that we too might be forgiving people, that we might be your faithful disciples who live in the way of Jesus with compassion and grace and love and mercy. We thank you, O oh God, for all of the many ways that we see you at work in our lives. Through the beauty of creation, through the rain that falls and gives us nourishment and life and growth. O oh God, we are grateful for your presence with us in the midst of the joys and the sunshine and in the midst of the storms and the sorrow. You are constant in our lives. And we cling to that. In the midst of uncertain times in our world, in the midst of uncertain times with school beginning, we know that you are there. We thank you for that presence. We lift to you today, O oh God, all of those things that we hold in our hearts, the things that we have said aloud, the many in our community who need healing and grace and who need to know your peace. We lift them to you, O oh God, because we know that you will surround them with your love and your peace and your mercy. Surround us with your love and your peace and mercy that we might be faithful to you in all that we do. We thank you most of all for Jesus for the word that became flesh, that lived among us, that lived and died and rose again, that we might have hope for eternal life in you. We thank you and we praise you for that. And we pray all of these things today, O oh God, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to our time of offering this morning, we appreciate your continued support of the ministry of our church, that we might be a hopeful presence to the people of our community and beyond, that we might love God, love people, and indeed serve the world. So as Teresa comes to pray over the offering, we pray for the offerings that are in our plate this morning, those that are received online, and those that come in the mail. Um, grateful again for your continued support. Would you join me at home in the offertory prayer? Patient Lord, you amaze us each day with your ability to forgive our many sins. You display merciful acts and answer our prayers in profound ways. Help us to be stewards of your mercy and grace as these monetary gifts are transformed into active ministries. Multiply the span of these ministries to reach people in new ways. We pray 
in the name of the one who teaches true forgiveness, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 389, Freely, Freely. Make sure you sing at home.